When studying military history, you will often come across organizational terms, the names of units, such as companies, battalions and regiments. Now, not only are these organizational terms very common, but they're also vital for understanding military history. You will need to be able to tell apart a battalion from a brigade, uh, need to know what is meant by a company action, and have a good understanding of how these different units fit together in their chain of command, which one is subordinate to the other. This episode of the Military History Handbook will explain army organization, the names of the different units, and their chain of command. Now there are some important things to note uh, before we move on. First of all is that we are discussing army organization, the army being a specific branch of the armed forces, different from the navy or air force. Those branches follow different organizations which are not applicable to this episode. This one is fully focused on the ground forces, the army branch. A second point to note is that within the army there are different arms, the infantry, the artillery and the armored arm, to name a few examples. In this episode we will be discussing all of the different arms, but we will mainly use the infantry arm as a reference point and then integrate the other arms when necessary. Another point has to do with terminology. We will mainly be using American terminology. There can be uh, quite a large difference between how different nations armies uh, name their units. So to streamline this episode, we will be focusing on American terminology and involve foreign terminology uh, where needed. Another point has to do with the timeline. Now there isn't a huge difference between time periods. Uh, these organizational terms are generally applicable, but it is at times uh, nice to have a uh, sort of a timeline pinpoint to reference. Uh, so this episode will be using the Second World War as our timeline reference. Uh, finally, we will be using NATO symbology to visualize these units. Using NATO symbology is quite common among military historians, even when referring to earlier conflicts. The uh, standard accepted NATO symbology can be used even uh, referencing conflicts that happened before NATO. But with those points out of the way, we can move on to the units themselves. Now, starting out with a global overview here, we have the entire list of units that we will be discussing, from smallest to the largest. It goes up from uh, squad, followed by platoon, company, battalion, regiment and brigade, division, corps, army and army group. Now, we will be going over all these units in more detail. But while we are looking at this overview, we can already draw a dividing line here between division and core. And what this divides is the uh, tactical units being the smaller ones, so the divisions and below. Uh, these you can see uh, almost like a chess piece. They have a certain role that they fulfill. They are organized a certain way. And that's how they are typically used. Whereas the larger formations on the other side of the cutoff line, so the core army and army group, they are more a operational formation, which you can see as a sort of a uh, brain, which then handles those chess pieces, those tactical chess pieces, on the larger operational chess board. And we will get into this uh, difference between these tactical units and operational formations uh, later as well. But this is one dividing line we can already draw. So we have these smaller uh, sort of ready-made tactical organizations that follow a strict organizational template to fulfill a certain tactical role and then the larger operational formations which then handle these chess pieces on the larger operational scale and these are often very uh, mission orientated commands so there isn't a strict organization for a corps or an army they are more uh, given the chess pieces that they need uh, to fulfill their uh, mission at that moment at that place now we can move on to the units themselves. We will start at the bottom with the smallest one, with the squad. A good rule of thumb is that a squad needs to be big enough to have a tactical impact on its own, but small enough that it can be led by a single commander. So a general size for a squad is around 10 men. Uh, the commander of a squad is usually a non-commissioned officer or at times a senior enlisted man. Now the squad itself is actually made up of some smaller units, often called teams or groups. Although they are so small and they are so dependent on the squad that they fall outside the scope of this episode. 
But there is one thing to note. The squad itself uh, often consists of around two teams or groups of three to five men, um, which is one subdivision you can make. But for the purposes of this video, we will take the squad itself, the entirety, uh, as a single unit. Now, in the armored or artillery arm, the equivalent of a squad would be the crew, which is manning a vehicle or a weapon, uh, often ranging from five to ten men. Moving on from the squad, the next uh, unit in line is the platoon. A platoon consists usually of three squads and a small headquarters. Commanding the platoon is uh, a officer, so this being the first uh, unit with a officer, uh, usually being a lieutenant. Now, a platoon taken together, so the three squads and the headquarters numbers around 30 to 40 men. In the armored arm, there are also platoons. These usually contain around three to five uh, vehicles with the same command structure. So a officer and he commands those three or five uh, vehicles, those vehicles being equivalent to a squad with their crew and non-commissioned officer. Uh, the same is true for the heavier infantry weapons, such as machine guns and mortars and anti-tank guns. Uh, they are often also organized in platoons, usually ranging from four or six uh, weapons. Again, the same command structure, so a lieutenant in charge of the platoon, and then every uh, one of those four to six weapons having a crew, usually with a non-commissioned officer in charge. Next in line is the company. A company usually being made up of three of the platoons just discussed, and again, a headquarters. Now, the company can be considered the largest full combat unit, in the sense that it is still uh, very much geared towards frontline combat, whereas the larger units, which we will be discussing uh, after the company, uh, have a, a larger non-combat supporting echelon. Now, companies are typically made up of three of those platoons just discussed, uh, sometimes they have an allotment of special weapons as well. For example, anti-tank rocket launchers are usually pulled at the company level. Uh, sometimes they have a small fire support element as well, such as a mortar squad or a machine gun squad. And some companies also have a small uh, support element, uh, be it supply or administrative. Uh, so companies can at times have a small non-combat element, but generally speaking, the company itself is still very much a, the largest frontline combat unit. Now, taken together, a company um, ranges from around 120 to 140 men and is usually led by a captain or a major. Now, in the artillery arm, the equivalent of a company would be a battery, a battery uh, usually consisting of four guns. Next in line is the battalion, battalion now being a significantly larger unit, often containing three of those combat companies just discussed. Uh, but having uh, quite extensive support elements as well, including a much larger non-combat support element. So the battalion, there are usually three of those frontline companies. Usually a fourth company is a heavy weapon support company. So typical battalion weapons uh, include heavy machine guns, mortars, uh, anti-tank guns, uh, usually grouped in this heavy weapons company. Now battalions usually have a fifth company as well, being a non-combat support company. Uh, this company has uh, service uh, elements, so um, an aid station, a repair station, some limited transportation, a uh, message center or a communications uh, center, field kitchens. And of course the battalion has a headquarters as well. Battalion is usually being led by a lieutenant colonel and he has a small staff to assist him, often with specialized officers as well. For example, a intelligence officer or a supply officer. Now moving on from the battalion, next we have uh, the regiment or brigade. Uh, now these are separate levels, but I've grouped them together because they are quite similar, but they're quite confusing as well, especially with the Second World War as a time period. There are some uh, significant national differences in how regiments and brigades are interpreted. This mainly has to do with the British and Commonwealth armies, who have a very different interpretation of the regiment compared to other armies, such as the Americans or the Germans. Uh, we will start out with the more common uh, American-German interpretation before moving on to the British uh, version. So how a regiment is usually seen as a tactical organization is a grouping of battalions, like we just discussed, uh, but being of a single arm. So a infantry regiment contains infantry battalions and a tank regiment contains tank battalions. 
and they are very much dependent on the division level, which we will talk about next, to group these single arm regiments into a combined arms division, whereas the regiment itself is uh, very much dependent on this division level. A regiment on its own does not have the combined arms to operate independently. For example, an infantry regiment usually consists of around three infantry battalions and then maybe an anti-tank company or a light gun company attached. A brigade, on the other hand, has the size of a regiment, but it is a mixed combined arms uh, unit. So it doesn't just contain battalions of a single arm, but it contains mixed battalions, so maybe infantry and tanks and artillery mixed together, making it independent. So just like a division, it is a uh, autonomous combined arms unit, but at a smaller level. So that's the niche that the brigades fulfills. is smaller than a division, but still capable of autonomous combined arms action. Now, in both cases, they number into around 3,000 men and are usually commanded by a colonel or brigadier. Now, what makes it difficult is the British and Commonwealth armies, they also use the term regiment, but for them it wasn't a tactical organization. Instead, it was more of an administrative or ceremonial title, which referred to a battalion. So, in British military history, when talking about a frontline unit and they reference a regiment, it is often concerning just a single battalion, but it carries the name of a certain regiment. These units have a very long lineage, and they have their historical roots often in a regimental title, meaning they are referred to as a regiment or the regiment, even though, tactically speaking, they are a battalion size unit. The uh, closest actual tactical unit to the regiment that the British and Commonwealth armies used, they called the brigade, confusingly enough. But a Commonwealth Brigade was more like a regiment, in the sense that it was a single arm grouping of battalions. The British and Commonwealth armies also used independent brigades, which were closer to the uh, brigades of other armies, in the sense that they were more a combined arms grouping. So this does make it somewhat difficult, but as a general rule, when um, considering a British action and a regiment is discussed, they're usually talking about a battalion-sized tactical unit, whereas a brigade refers to a regimental size tactical unit. Now, next in line is the division. Division being a very important uh, level of command, especially during the Second World War, as it was the largest of the tactical uh, chess pieces. And it, this also made it a, a combined arms formation. In order to have a role on the battlefield, you need uh, such a large tactical unit to be of combined arms. So it needs to have a mix of the different arms, be it infantry, artillery, armored, uh, engineers, anti-tank, anti-aircraft, uh, to make it a versatile formation. These smaller units, of course, they can be more specific. A battalion or a regiment can be of a single arm. But the largest tactical unit, the division, uh, really needs this combined arms nature in order to uh, play its role on the battlefield. So divisions are usually made up of multiple regiments of different arms. Depending on the type of division, it can be uh, include more different types. So for example, an infantry uh, division usually contains around three infantry regiments and then a fourth artillery regiment, as well as some battalions of the smaller arms, such as a engineer battalion, a reconnaissance battalion, an anti-tank battalion. So those are the smaller arms that support the uh, regiments of the larger arms and they are all organic to the division. So the division is a very, uh, has a large array of specializations, making it very independent. It's not, necess it's not dependent on outside attachments. Uh, an armored division, for example, has a mix of tank regiments and infantry regiments and artillery regiments, making it even more of a combined arms force. Now, a division numbers uh, often over 10,000 men, sometimes closer to 20,000 men, and is usually commanded by a major general. Now, with the division, we've covered the last of the technical units, and now we're moving into the uh, more operational formations, the first of them being the core. Now, the way you can see these uh, corps and armies and army groups is that they are very much focused on their headquarters and then the subordinate elements. So in the case of a core, the subordinate elements are the divisions just discussed. They are like the limbs being attached to a brain, so the core what makes the core is very much its headquarters, which is like a separate brain. And then to this brain, you attach the different tactical units, such as the divisions, to give it uh, the tools to work with. So a core is usually made up of around two to five 
divisions and the different divisions can change depending on the mission of the core so they're very flexible they can uh, be given divisions or they have to hand in divisions uh, and besides the divisions which form the backbone of the core they are often given very specialized battalions as well as a more specialized uh, toolkit to help their more general divisions in certain combat actions now we have already discussed the battalion but that was more of a uh, regular line battalion which was part of a regiment or a brigade the specialized independent battalions which we are talking about now at the core level they are of battalion size but they are of a very different nature they are very specialized units often handling uh, quite rare equipment and it would be a, a waste of that specialization to attach them permanently to a division because a division might not need a highly specialized battalion all of the time or a division would be in reserve meaning the battalion isn't doing anything while they might be needed on a sector of the front so some of these battalions which are very specialized for example a heavy tank battalion or a heavy anti-tank battalion or a rocket artillery battalion instead of assigning them to a division they are kept independent and then given to the core or army level for them to then assign them to the right place at the right time where they can make the best use of their specialization so an example would be a core with a offensive mission having to breach an enemy defensive line they might assign a rocket artillery battalion to the division that has to make the initial assault so they this division which is a fairly standard organization is then complemented with a specialized battalion to give it more firepower for its specific task Another example would be a core with a defensive mission uh, assigning a heavy tank destroyer battalion to one of the divisions who is under tank threat because they are defending a area which is very suited to enemy tank attack then they might be given this heavy anti-tank battalion to complement their anti-tank defense. Now cores usually number into the tens of thousands of men and can be commanded by a lieutenant general. A final thing to note about the core is that it shouldn't be confused with the more administrative title of uh, for example the marine corps that is more a ceremonial title referring to a in this case a branch of the uh, the armed forces but this isn't the same as the core as the operational formation we are now discussing it's more of an administrative title so to avoid this confusion you can refer to the core as a operational formation as a army corps now corps are usually subordinated to the army being the next level armies usually contain around two to three corps and can also be assigned those same independent battalions we just discussed uh, but then keeping them at army level instead of corps level that's also an option now a army uh, usually numbers into the hundreds of thousands of men and is commanded by a general typically now just like with the corps the army can be confused with the army as the branch of the armed forces uh, but that's a different thing so this is the army as a operational formation being distinct from the army as the branch of the armed forces so to avoid this confusion you can call a operational formation army a field army and finally the largest level we will be discussing is the army group an army group is a formation of around two to three armies with a uh, number of men uh, often numbering uh, into a million or more army groups are usually commanded by a general or field marshal and because they are such massive formations they are often tied to a specific geographical region as well so they uh, streamline the operations of multiple armies in a certain geographical area for example the Italian uh, theater in the second world war had one army group managing the operations of multiple armies all contained within the Italian peninsula another thing to note about the army group because of their size is that they are often a multinational formation because they are such a large formation it is very difficult for a single army to create an army group of its own so what you often see is that army groups are a type of coalition warfare with different armies having uh, their corps or divisions or armies assigned to a allied army group being a coalition of different uh, nations formed in this operational army group now there is one larger level of command being the theater but the theater is a joint command 
So it also includes Navy and Air Force uh, formations, which makes it fall outside the scope of this episode. Now this episode is getting quite long and complicated, so a good way to close is with an example to help memorize how these different units fit together using a real-world historic example. And the example we will be using is the famous Easy Company, well known from the television series Band of Brothers. Easy Company being part of the 101st Airborne Division. And what we will do in this example is explore the entire chain of command that Easy Company was part of. Both its own subordinate units, so the platoons and squads, as well as the chain of command above Easy Company. The time and place we will be using for this example is the attack on the French town of Carentan as part of the Normandy campaign. Now, starting at the very top with the army group that Easy Company was part of, this would be the 21st Army Group under command of General Montgomery, which was put in charge of all Allied ground forces landing on the Normandy coast with the goal of establishing an initial lodgment on the European continent. The 21st Army Group in turn consisted of two armies, the 2nd British Army, which would be landing to the east on the Normandy coast, and the 1st US Army landing on the west. The 1st US Army being under command of Lieutenant General Bradley at the time. Now, the 1st US Army in turn consisted of two corps because it would be assaulting two beaches. Omaha Beach to the east was the responsibility of 5th Corps, whereas Utah Beach to the west was the responsibility of 7th Corps under Major General Collins. Now, 7th Corps consisted of multiple infantry divisions, which would be hitting the beach, and also two airborne divisions, one of them being the 101st Airborne Division under Major General Taylor. And these airborne divisions were given the task of landing behind the coastal defenses and securing uh, mainly infrastructure objectives, so crossroads and bridges. Now, a army level objective here was to create a unified 1st Army beachhead by linking up the two corps. Because 7th and 5th Corps were landing quite far apart, they had separate core beachheads. And one of the initial objectives was to link those two core beachheads together to create a 1st Army beachhead. Now, a crucial objective here was the French town of Carentan, which was a uh, road and railroad junction, precisely in the middle of these two core areas. So uh, one of the 7th Corps objectives was to take Carantan and thereby link up with 5th Corps to their east, and then Carantan would facilitate east-west communications between the two corps. Of the divisions making up the 7th Corps, the 101st Airborne Division was the closest to Carantan because their drop zone was fairly far to the south. So they were then, by 7th Corps, the 101st Airborne Division was given the objective of taking Carantan and thereby linking up with 5th Corps. It was then up to uh, General Taylor, the 101st Airborne Division commander, to take Carantan. And the way he did this was by maneuvering his regiments. Of course, being a division commander, he was maneuvering his regiments around. And the plan he came up with was to first encircle the town and then attack it from multiple directions. So this division plan then led to regimental action. And the regiment we will be specifically looking at is the 506th Parachute Infantry Regiment under Colonel Sink. This regiment was given the task of performing a night march on the 11th of June along the western approach of Carentan and then swing to the east uh, at the south of the town and occupy Hill 30, which was a dominant height overlooking the southern approach to Carentan. And while the 506th was doing this on the night of the 11th of June, the other regiments of the division were performing similar actions to the north and east of Carentan thereby uh, isolating the town in preparation for the attack, which would then uh, be launched from both the south and the north. The 506th Regiment, which was by then positioned at Hill 30 to the south of Carantan, uh, would in the early hours of the 12th of June send one of its battalions into Carantan as part of the attack. And this task was given to the 2nd Battalion, so the 506th Parachute Infantry Regiment consisted of three battalions, Two battalions would hold the line to the south of the town, and then the 2nd Battalion would move north into the town itself. The 2nd Battalion was commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Strayer, and it contained three companies, being Dog, Easy, and Fox companies. And here we have reached Easy Company. So they would be part of a battalion attack into the southern outskirts of Carantan. And the way uh, Lieutenant Colonel Strayer organized his attack was to have uh, Dog Company would remain uh, behind in reserve. 
Easy Company would advance along the right flank following a uh, south to north road into the town. And then Fox Company would be on their left flank advancing into the town as well. So now we have reached uh, Easy Company advancing along the right flank of the battalion down the road, which is where the television series picks up the action. So what we see here is at the time First Lieutenant Winters being in command of Easy Company because the the actual company commander was killed during the uh, initial uh, uh, drop. So second lieutenant, uh, so first lieutenant Winters was in charge of the company instead. Uh, he then had three platoons to work with, a easy company consisting of first, second, and third platoon. Uh, the way Winters then arrayed his platoons was to have first platoon advancing along the left side of the road, second platoon along the right side of the road, and then third platoon back in reserve. So here we see a company action with a company commander using his three platoons. Now the first platoon was led by second lieutenant Welsh. And what happened is as the entire company advanced down the road, they came under uh, machine gun fire from a German strong point overwatching the road from the outskirts of the town. Now what happened is the majority of the company got pinned down in the ditches along the road, but uh, the first platoon under second lieutenant Welsh, uh, Welsh and six of his men who were in the front of the platoon managed to run through the machine gun fire as it opened up and they reached the safety of the buildings at the outskirts of the town, while the machine gun was distracted by firing at the rest of the company, which was pinned down along the road. So now we've found the uh, squad level. Even though this isn't technically a squad, in the sense that it was a uh, paper organization, because of course there was a, a platoon commander here, and it wasn't a full complement of the squad, it was only six men, along with Lieutenant Welsh. Uh, so it wouldn't technically count as a squad according to the paper organization, but this is a good example of the squad level. So seven men uh, infiltrating through the buildings and then eventually sneaking up on the German machine gun position and eliminating it with hand grenades, uh, thus opening the way for the company, which again is part of a battalion attack, which is part of a larger divisional attack. So here we have the entire chain of command. We started with the 21st Army Group, which was responsible for the entire invasion then worked our way down for the armies, the corps, the divisions, and then um, reached Easy Company itself, and then the very small tactical elements, the platoon, and eventually even a squad-sized element, all being identified in this large chain of command. As a closing remark to end this episode, it goes without saying that knowing these different levels of command and how they fit together in a chain is very important. But it is also just as important to be flexible with them, because these units themselves are also very flexible. They can be reinforced, they can be merged together or disbanded. A good example of flexible use of chains of command are the German Kampfgruppen from the Second World War. These were uh, temporary, very mission-orientated commands, often including a wide range of subordinate units, from platoons to companies to battalions, all with different specializations being unified for a certain mission, and then being disbanded again once the mission was complete. And it is by knowing this neat theoretical organization that we went over in this episode that you can better appreciate these more messy practical applications.